All right, so uh, another example of posterior is the rectum is posterior to the urinary bladder. So what does that mean? Well, posterior means towards the back, right, as opposed to anterior meaning towards the front. So the rectum, <laughs> that is posterior compared to the urinary bladder, which is on the front. The urinary bladder is anterior. Now, uh, as you know, you, you might say, how are you going to test this on this? So uh, we can give you all kinds of multiple choice questions and so on, where we would might, might be saying something very similar. You know, the rectum is what compared to the urinary bladder? I might say superior, inferior, anterior, uh, posterior, distal, proximal, and you've got to say the right term, because only one of those in any question I give you would be correct. Or, or, or appropriate. There are many, many practice questions. I talked about this on Monday. You remember my website? You remember all those links? You remember all those multiple choice questions you can practice and test yourself on? Uh, there are practice questions in the lab manual. This is covered in exercise one of the lab manual. Remember, there's two books you need, my lecture outline and the lab manual. And the lab manual's got a whole bunch of questions on this to practice. So there's plenty of resources to get practice, and if you do enough of them, you'll, have, you'll get it, and it's pretty simple and straightforward. You want, uh, the next pair of terms, question. question. Just on the superior, in the book it says cephalic. Cephalic is another word that means head. We're going to be learning it. We'll get to it. All right. Uh, okay, the next pair of terms, uh, medial and uh, lateral. These are easy, and they're very important. Medial means towards the middle of the body, medial. Lateral means towards the side. So here's a couple of examples. Your uh, heart is located medial compared to your lungs. Well, does that make sense? Where's your heart? About here. Where's your lungs? To the sides, lateral. We, can't say, we could say your heart is medial to your lungs. We could say your lungs are lateral compared to your heart. These are comparative terms. We're always comparing one part of our body with another. Another example, your kidneys are lateral to your spine. Go ahead and say, I don't get that. What do you mean? Well, uh, your spine, your vertebral column, that's along the middle of your body. Your kidneys are the sides. They're on the sides. They're lateral compared to your vertebral column. All right. Uh, another pair of terms, very easy, proximal and distal. Proximal and distal. Yes, sir. Um, lateral? Um, how is that? Lateral means towards the sides. That's what it says. Right. Away from the midline, towards the sides. <coughs> all right. Uh, all right, proximal and distal. These are pretty easy. Proximal and distal are primarily used in terms of our limbs. Now, over the years, I, I've said the word limbs. And some people said, what are limbs? So I said, limbs are appendages. So they said, well, what are appendages? So I said, appendages are extremities. <laughs> they said, what are extremities? I'm running out of words. Arms and legs, how's that? Arms and legs. So we use proximal and distal especially for the arms and legs. So uh, where proximal means closer to the body, the torso is the body, and distal, does distal sound like the word distant? Further away from the body, the torso. So uh, we gave the example, your arms are proximal compared to your hand. Well, right, here's an arm, here's a hand. Which is closer to my body? The arm is closer to my body. I could have said my hand is distal compared to my arm. Another pair of ter another term example. Uh, your fingers are distal to your elbow. Well, here's the fingers. Here's the elbow. So which one's further from my body, my torso? Fingers are distal, distant compared to my elbow. Yes. Okay. So if you're talking about like if they're saying your thumb and if you're comparing your thumb and your pinky, we don't use the word proximal or distal. So you would use medial. And we lateral. use medial and lateral. That's right. Exactly. And, that, and, let's, and let's use, that's a good example right now. Because that's a, let's, use, let's talk about your thumb and your little finger. Now, we've already learned the word medial and lateral right above. Medial meant towards the middle of the body, lateral meant towards the sides. So which, if your thumb, is your thumb medial or lateral? 
Now your first thought might be, well, I don't know if I hold my hands this way or do I hold my hands this way? But there's a reference position, isn't there? We always assume your hands are this way. And in that case, your thumbs are lateral compared to your little finger. That's why there's a reference position. Otherwise, depending upon how you turned your hands, it would change. So the book says the thumb is blank for the ring finger. That's, that would the answer would be lateral. lateral. That's the way we use it. There's no other term that would work. All right. Uh, the, um, the, and these terms are used everywhere in physical examinations of patients and so on. Uh, and they're used, as we said, in surgical procedures and protocols uh, that you'll be learning about in your clinical program. Uh, the next pair of terms, very simple, uh, superficial and deep. Synonyms are external and internal. You know, we already did the lottery and uh, you're out. Okay, he's not even worried. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I kicked you out. This is, you weren't here. No, I didn't do it. But if I would have followed some advice, uh, we, you might have lost your place. All right. Uh, the, um, uh, <laughs> and I would have said, you made me do it. <laughs> I don't mind. Go ahead. Go then, then you'd have to fight it out. With right, don't worry. I wouldn't fight. Okay. The, uh, all right. Superficial and deep, or external and internal. So obviously, towards the surface of the body, we're deeper inside the body. So your skin is superficial compared to your muscles or your muscles are deep compared to your skin. The heart is deep to the rib cage, right? Well, here's the rib cage. Your heart is here. So which one is deeper? Your heart is deeper or more internal than your rib cage is. Or we could say your rib cage is superficial compared to your heart. Yes? Can we see that muscles are superficial to the bones? You could say your muscles are superficial to the bones, yes. Your muscles are attached to your bones. So uh, again, this is simple. But if you don't think it's simple, you're going to spend a lot of time on this, aren't you? And you're going to go over all those practice questions on all those links. Mm -hmm. You'd say, I don't have the time. Then don't take the class. <laughs> all right, the next pair of terms. Now, the next pair of terms on page A3, I will tell you right at the outset, of all the pairs of terms, this is the pair that bothers students the most. I'm going to explain it. Uh, if you don't get it, don't worry, because you will eventually get it. But this is the one that I know to bother students the most. The other should be straightforward. All right? Parietal and visceral. Parietal refers to the walls of a cavity, the walls of the body or a cavity. The word visceral, visceral actually refers to an internal organ. That's really what visceral means, internal organ. So it refers to an internal organ. So uh, let me give you an example. You say parietal, what do you mean? The walls, the visceral and internal organ. All right. Um, if I open my coat, you'll see there's a lining. If we make an incision on your abdomen and we spread your abdominal, your skin wide open, so we're now looking inside your ab abdominal cavity, there is a membrane attached to the inside wall of the skin. It's called the parietal peritoneum. Parietal means it's attached to the wall. Peritoneum, the word peritoneum, refers to the abdomen. So the parietal peritoneum, there's the word, peritoneum means abdomen. Parietal means it's associated with the wall. So again, if you cut open somebody's uh, belly, you spread open the skin, there's a shiny membrane, and we will see this when we start dissecting the cat, uh, and so on. You'll see this membrane just like where my lining of my coat is, and that's called the parietal, which means wall, peritoneum, which means abdomen. There's also a shiny membrane when we open up the chest cavity. That's called the parietal, which means wall, pleura. Plura means chest. We're going to learn those terms in just a moment. Now, on the other hand, there's another membrane that covers your intestine, or intestine, if you're British. All right. So uh, there's a membrane covering the intestine. The intestine is an internal organ. So this membrane covering the intestine, which is an internal organ, is called the visceral 
peritoneum. Visceral means it's around and associated with an internal organ. Peritoneum means ab in the abdominal area. All right? There's also a membrane covering the lungs. Since the lungs are an internal organ, it's called visceral. And since the lungs are in the chest area, it's called visceral pleura. Visceral pleura. We'll get to that. Another way of splitting the body apart is a frontal or coronal section which divides the body into anterior and posterior. You'd say, what does that mean? Anterior and posterior means front and back. So in other words, if I'm like this and we split my body like this into a front part and a back part, that's called a, 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 a frontal or coronal section. Now again, with MRI images, with CT images, we get a whole series of, uh, of coronal or frontal sections through the body. This is how we visualize the inside of a person. The last way of dividing the body is called a transverse or cross-section. So imagine we make a section right through here, dividing me into an upper part and a lower part, a superior and an inferior. That's called a cross-section or transverse section. And in fact, with a CT scan or an MRI, we don't just have one, we can have a whole series, right? A whole series of cross-sectional images through that body. So you should understand the three ways of dividing the body. Now, you've got a picture on A5 that shows this, kind of, but you have a much better picture in color in your lab manual. In your lab manual, exercise one, there's a, a color pictures of dividing the body in different ways. But this shows a cross-section dividing the body into an upper, lower, superior, and inferior part, a coronal or frontal section dividing the body into an anterior, posterior, or ventral and uh, uh, dorsal part, and uh, we've already talked about a mid sagittal section. Excuse me? Yes? Um, is there a specific place for the transverse plane? Well, we said you can have multiple transverse. You can have a whole series of them, and that's what they do. They don't just have one when you do a CT scan or an MRI. That goes, yeah. that goes for all they, are, they are called serial sections or serial images. Okay. Yes. How would you name the different sections? Would you just say like the first part, the second part, the different like parts of the actual scan? Like if they're doing more than one scan, like they, uh, they, num they number them. There's they're no particular like set numbers. Either. No, because they can decide how far apart they want these sections these images. They can have the, uh, more of them or fewer of them, depending upon how many images they want to create. All right. Uh, the, uh, all right, so we've talked about the three planes or views through the body. All right, let's just uh, look at major body cavities. There are two major cavities in our body, a dorsal body cavity and a ventral body cavity. What's a synonym for dorsal posterior? We already gave it to you on the previous page. What's the synonym? What, uh, uh, a synonym for ventral is anterior. So you could call these either posterior or dorsal or anterior or ventral body cavities. Now, uh, the dorsal body cavity uh, is further subdivided into a cranial and vertebral portion. A cranial and vertebral portion. What's, uh, and basically we're referring to a cavity that's on the back side of the body, dorsal or posterior means back side, and the upper part is called the cranial portion. What's inside the cranial portion of the dorsal body cavity is the brain. What's inside the vertebral or spinal part of the uh, dorsal body cavity is the spinal cord, is the spinal cord. We'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. There's also a ventral or anterior body cavity, also known as the silome, the silome. You'd say, what, do we have to know that word? You have to know all the words I give you. Uh, and uh, this is where most of your visceral organs are. Visceral means internal organs. They're in the ventral body cavity. Now, where's the ventral body cavity? Ventral means on the front, or ventral or anterior. So there's this big body cavity here containing a lot of organs. We divide it into an upper part and a lower part. The upper part is called the thoracic or chest portion. The lower is called the abdominal, right, or belly part. What separates the upper thoracic 
from the lower abdominal is the diaphragm muscle. The diaphragm muscle, again, if you've had college biology with the lab, so you saw the pig and you saw the diaphragm muscle separating the chest from the belly cavity. So the diaphragm muscle is an important muscle that separates the upper chest from the belly cavity, the abdominal cavity, and the diaphragm muscle is used for what purpose? Breathing. It's used for breathing. All right. Now, another synonym for thoracic is plural. Right? A synonym for abdominal is peritoneal. We told you that a little bit just uh, on the top of this page. Same page, uh, peritoneal or abdominal. Uh, all right, let's look at a picture to help us understand this. Remember, whatever pictures I give you, you've got pictures in color in your lab manual. Uh, take a look at page A5. So on A5, all right, now uh, here what we're looking at is a, a, a cut through the body. It's actually a mid-sagittal section. It divides the body into a right and left half. That's a mid-sagittal section. Uh, let's start with the ventral part. This is the ventral body cavity. It says ventral cavity. It's also known as an anterior body cavity. Ventral or anterior means towards the front. The upper part's called the thoracic. What's another word for thoracic? Chest? Plural. Plural. In fact, the word is, I'm not even going to write it because it's right here. Okay? Thoracic or plural. They but mean chest. All right? Then there's the lower abdominal. What's another word for abdominal? Peritoneal. Right? Abdominal or peritoneal. What separates the thoracic or pleural cavity from the lower abdominal or peritoneal? The diaphragm muscle. All right, so that's the diaphragm muscle that separates the two. Now, sometimes they also make a distinction between the abdominal and the pelvic. All right, that's way down here at the bottom of the abdominal. So let's summarize uh, this, what I've just said. This large cavity on the front side of your body is called the ventral body cavity, which means front side. It's divided into an upper part and a lower part. What separates them is the diaphragm muscle used for breathing. The upper part's called the thoracic or pleural portion. Well, obviously, that's where your heart and lungs are. The lower part is called your abdominal or peritoneal portion. That's where your, obviously your stomach and intestines are. Uh, here we can see in this view, and what kind of view is this? What kind of section or view is this? There's only three types of views, right? There's a, a sad, mid-sagittal, there's a frontal, and there's a cross-section. This is a frontal view. Frontal is also called a coronal view. This is a frontal view. So here we have, this is again the chest or thoracic or pleural part. This is the abdominal or peritoneal part, and it's separated by the diaphragm muscle. And that's obviously where most of our internal organs are. Now, coming back over to this image, there's also a cavity on the back side of the body. The word for back side is dorsal, or what's another word for back side? Posterior. So this is the posterior dorsal cavity. And it's, uh, it's on the back side. It's divided into an upper <coughs> cranial part and a lower vertebral part. What's inside the upper cranial is your brain. You said, does it say that? Yeah, I think it says it pretty clearly there. Brain's in the cranial cavity. And what's inside the vertebral portion is the spinal cord. All right. One more thing, so what's another name for the ventral body cavity? Coelom. You'd say, where's that word again? So back on page A3. On A3, another name for the ventral or anterior body cavity is the coelom. Now, how some of you have heard the word coelom, and it's okay if you haven't heard it before, but you do need to learn it. How some of you have heard the word coelom is you've had nature's biology. 
Now, not everybody in this class has had majors biology, but some of you have. If you've had majors biology where you cover comparative vertebrate anatomy and invertebrates, you heard about how some animals are called acelomates, pseudocelomates, and eucelomates. Anybody remember, ever hear those terms? All right, so that's how they categorize whether, to what extent, the structure formation of this ventral body cavity exists. All right, so uh, here's a whole bunch of uh, uh, clinical terms, and uh, we're going to learn a lot more. Uh, abdominal obviously means abdomen. What's a synonym for abdomen? Peritoneal, right? Uh, acro, what does acro mean? Acro means extremity. You'd say, what's extremity? Appendage. What's an appendage? A limb. What's a limb? Arms and legs. Now, you'd say, I don't get that. Acro means arms or legs, extremities, appendages. I, uh, I don't get that word. So here's a, a medical term you may or may not have heard of. There's a term called acromegaly. Acromegaly. Acro means limb, extremity. Mega means enlarged, big. Acromegaly is when there's enlarged limbs, especially hands and feet. Now you'd say, why does somebody get acromegaly? We're going to talk more about this condition. It ha occurs with excess growth hormone in an adult. Acromegaly, when somebody has excessive amounts of growth hormone as an adult, it en causes enlargement of uh, their chin and their hands and feet. It's called acromegaly. And acro is leg and leg. Ac well, acro is extremity. Okay. Uh, adeno. Adeno means gland. So I want to, I'm going to give you an example, but before I do, I'm going to write just right here at the top. Now these are all prefixes. You'll notice these are labeled prefixes. What's a prefix? Something that occurs at the beginning. Now again, this is why taking a medical terminology ter a course, you start to learn all this junk. So some of us don't even know the difference between a prefix and a suffix. I'm going to give you a suffix ending. Suffixes come at the end. So an example of a suffix, I'm going to write it right up here, is oma. Oma. This is something added to the end of a word. Does anybody know what oma means? It means tumor, a tumor. So if OMA means tumor, let's put these words together. This is exactly what a medical terminology course does. All right, so if we combine adeno with OMA, we call that an adenoma. So what's an adenoma? A tumor in a gland. Obviously, depending upon which gland, it could be a, a, an adenoma of the thyroid, an adenoma of the adrenal, an adenoma of the pituitary. So this is what we call medical terminology, and there's a lot of that in this course. Follow my advice, for those of you I've suggested that to. You'll thank me, even if you hate me now. All right? You'll get a lot of that out of that class, and you will feel so much more confident. Angio. Angio means vessel. Let me give you a couple of examples. So uh, we actually gave this a, a example uh, on Monday. An angiogram. Anybody remember what that is? It's a, a picture of like the vessels in the heart. Yes, it's a picture of a blood vessel. A gram means a picture or image. Angio means vessel. We were talking about how uh, they can inject a dye into the bloodstream and take an x-ray image. Normally, x-rays only allow us to see what? Bones. Bones and teeth. That's it. Hard structures. But if we inject a dye, we're able to use the x-ray to see soft structures. Uh, arthro. So arthro, of course, means joint. So it's really easy to understand the word arthritis, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, itis... Very common suffix ending. Itis means an inflammation. It means, itis means inflammation or infection. So that's a very widely used suffix ending. Uh, cardio means heart. So we certainly understand what a cardiologist would be. Cardiologist is a heart doctor. Uh, chondro is cartilage. So we see uh, uh, that applied in various contexts. We'll get into 
some specific examples. I'm not going to give you an example of that at the moment. Uh, cysto. Cysto or cyst means a bladder. A bladder is a sac. And so an example of that would be cystitis. Cystitis is a urinary bladder infection. A urinary bladder infection is cystitis. We'll learn later, cholecystitis is a gallbladder infection. It's a little sack. It's a fluid-filled sack. It's a little sack filled with fluid. No, well, it's just uh, not. not uh, it, it could be uh, bladder infections. Urinary bladder infections are usually E. coli. You get that in microbiology. We'll touch upon it. Cyto means cell, so we're going to be covering cytology. Ology is a suffix ending meaning study of, so cytology is the study of cells. Uh, one of the health-related fields is cytotechnology, cytotechnologists. Those are the people who do uh, analysis of the chromosomes and identify whether, for example, a child has Down syndrome, a cytotechnologist. Uh, dento means tooth, so it's pretty obvious then why they're called dentists, isn't it? It means tooth. Uh, dermato and dermo both mean skin, so we understand what dermatology is. Duodno. What's duodno? Duodno. You'd say thank you very much. <laughs> duodno means duodno. Does anybody know what's the duodno? It's the part of your uh, intestine. It's the first part of the small intestine. The first portion of the small intestine where most digestion of food occurs is the duodno. Gastro is the stomach, so what would gastritis be? Right, inflammation or infection of the stomach. Hepato is liver, and so uh, well, what would hepatitis be? Inflammation of the liver. Inflammation or infection of the liver. How about a hepatoma? Uh, a tumor, tumor, not necessarily cancer, but a tumor of the liver. Oma means tumor, is how we put these words together. Laryngo means larynx. One comment I'd like to make, uh, well, first of all, what is the larynx? The larynx is your voice box. That's your voice box. That's where your vocal cords are. So an example is laryngitis. So if somebody has laryngitis, if they have laryngitis, they're hoarse. Notice how you spell horse. It has an A in it. If you leave out the A, you're saying that the person's like an animal that eats hay. This is horse. horse is, you can't speak. That's because of laryngitis. Notice the correct pronunciation is laryngitis. The correct pronunciation is larynx. It is very common for people to incorrectly say larynx. If you say larynx, you're saying it as if the N came before the Y. Right? Larnix. Well, it's not larnix. It's larynx. Now, I don't test you on how you pronounce words, but you remember on Monday I showed you there's a website where you can click on it and learn how to correctly pronounce words. Remember, people do judge you on the way you speak. Right? So it sounds, if you don't pronounce any words right, then they kind of say, do you really know this stuff? All right? Uh, myo. Myo is muscle. Myology is the study of muscles. Myositis is an inflammation of the muscles. Uh, nephro is kidney. So what's nephritis? Inflammation, inflammation or infection of the kidneys. Uh, neuro, so we would understand what neurology is. Right? Neurology, the study of the nerves and the nervous system. Osteo is bone. Huh? Okay, that's a good example, osteoporosis. That's where the bone becomes more porous, right, from a lack of calcium mineral. Odo, odo means ear. So otitis is an ear infection. An otolaryngologist. <laughs> otolaryngologist. Is it odo or auto? Either way, okay. okay. So uh, now patho, we learned on Monday was disease. At the very bottom of page A1, we talked about pathological anatomy. We 
patho means disease. So a pathologist is a doctor who specializes in disease uh, pathology. Uh, pneumono means lung. So we've all heard of pneumonia, which is certainly a serious lung disease. Rhino means nose. So uh, an example, if somebody has rhinitis, rhinitis would be an inflammation or infection of the nose. Actually, it's usually used to refer to a cold. If somebody has a cold, they have rhinitis. Here's a term you've heard. Rhinoplasty. Plastic surgery of the nose, right? A nose job. Rhinoplasty. Stomato is mouth. For you future dental hygienists, stomatitis is an infection or inflammation inside the mouth. Stomatitis. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Stomatitis. Uh, and thoraso, of course, means chest. And remember, a synonym for thoraso or chest is plural. All right, there's a whole lot of these terms. This is just the beginning. Okay, We're, there's a whole cool. book of this stuff. Huh? What's the last one? I just, I just, uh, thoraso just means chest. So, uh, thoracic surgeon, you know. Uh, all right. Uh, on, let's look at the last page of this uh, on A6. All right, now, uh, here's a, this is a drawing. We're going to learn what the anatomic parts of the body are called. You've got a picture just like this in your lab manual, except it's even more beautiful. It's in color. Right, so you're all going to get the uh, lab manual. I don't care what edition. And uh, so here's what the picture looks like yeah, in the lab manual. Now, I'm not even going to ask you to know all of these terms that are in your lab manual. Again, you're using my lecture as your guide for what it is you need to know. This is page three in the lab manual, so that's certainly at the beginning. All right, so let's, uh, starting up here at the top left. This is all simple. Uh, most of anatomy is very simple. It's just boring memorizing. But you've got to know all the words. If you don't know the words, then you don't know medical terminology, medical jargon. All right, so, uh, okay, cephalic means head. So you asked the question earlier. You said the book said use the word cephalic instead of cranial, right? Cepha it was cephalic. Cephalic and cranial mean head. That's what you asked me about. What, am I right? You're right. I'm right. All right, the, uh, now, uh, cranial uh, is skull. Facial means face. Orbital and ocular mean eye. Orbital and ocular mean eye. And uh, buckle is cheek. That's an important term in dental hygiene. Buckle is cheek. Uh, cervical is neck. So last class meeting, we talked about, and we began this morning, speaking about anatomic landmarks, and we mentioned uh, the spinous process of the seventh cervical vertebra in the neck. Uh, thoracic is chest. Mammary is breast. Uh, the armpit is axillary. Uh, right here, circled, elbow is cubital. Now, here's how some of you have heard that word cubital. You'd say, I never heard of it in my life. So if you read an English translation of the biblical account of God telling Noah to build the ark, he says it should be so many cubits. Ever hear that term? What's a cubit? A cubit is the distance between the elbow and the fingertip. That's called a cubit. You'd say, yeah, but wouldn't it be different for different people? Yeah, it's not such an exact measurement. But that's called a cubit, all right, because that's a cubital. All right, now, if the elbow is cubital, the front side of the elbow is called anti-cubital. Anti means in front. Anti means in front. An antechamber is a room 
before the, the, an entryway into a bigger room. But let me give you some other examples of ante, meaning in front. If you go, these are Latin roots. If you go to an Italian restaurant, an Italian restaurant, you look at the menu. Before they list, before they list pasta dishes, they list antipasta. Antipasta are what they serve before, in front of, before the pasta, like salads. That's called antipasta. Where you've also heard that term anti is if you're playing a poker game. So if you go to Las Vegas and you're going to go and wager some money, right, before the dealer deals you a card, they'll say ante up. You ever heard that? Ante up. Put some money in in front before I give you a card. You're going to play the game. So ante means in front of. Uh, just a, a, an anti-cubital area is very, very important because that's the sweet spot for drawing blood. Every time they want blood, that's the favorite spot. We're going to be learning about the blood vessels there later. Now, the uh, upper arm is brachial. One of the major muscles in the upper arm is called the biceps brachii. Brachii. That's the muscle in the upper arm. Brachial means upper arm. Now, uh, the forearm, which is in front of the upper arm, is the antibrachial. Anti means in front of. Before. So we've got antecubital and antebrachial. Carpal is wrist. And you've heard of people having carpal tunnel syndrome, right? Problems where they wear wrist support. Uh, palmar and volar both mean palm. Here's volar, here's um, palmar. They both mean the uh, anterior surface of the hand or palm area. And then the thumb is the pollux. The fingers or digits are called phalanges. So the fingers are digits or phalanges. The entire hand is manual. And now you understand what is meant by manual labor. Manual labor is what you do by hand. Because that manual means by hand. It means hand. Uh, the uh, front of the uh, knee is patellar. Some of you may have learned in biology. If you had me for biology lab, you learned this. The kneecap is the patellar. Uh, the lower leg is curl. Curl means lower leg. The foot is pedal. And now you understand why they're called accelerator and brake pedals, because that's where your foot goes. Pedal is the, word, is the foot. Uh, the big toe is the hallux. Don't confuse it with the thumb, which is pollux. You'd say, wow, it seems like I'm going to have to write a lot of these like note cards to you know, practice testing myself on this. That's right. You're going to be spending a couple of hours a day studying. Right? 10 to 20 hours a week. Which is what? I'm sorry? No, the uh, hallux is the big toe, pollux is the thumb. It's, it's labeled there. Palmar and volar mean palm. It's all labeled there. You just memorize it. Anatomy is simple. You just memorize it. Lots and lots to memorize. Okay, uh, on, uh, here on the lower right, toes are also called digits or phalanges. So it's interesting. We use the same term for toes as we do for fingers, phalanges. Uh, the top surface of the foot is the dorsal, or dorsum. And the ankle is tarsal. Don't confuse the ankle, tarsal, with the wrist, which is carpal. You know what would be really good to prepare you for all this stuff? A medical terminology course. Because <laughs> if you just had a course where you didn't have to learn all the anatomy, all the histology, the cytology, the embryology, which we're going to do in this class... And you could just spend a course learning the terms. That would make this class easier, wouldn't it? What do you think? I could be a salesman, couldn't I? Right. Now, um, going up here to the top right, so again, cephalic means head, cervical means neck. The back of the neck is nuchal. Nuchal, N-U-C-H-A-L. 
Uh, the back side is the dorsal side. Another synonym for dorsal is posterior. <clears throat> and then the back surface of the hand is the dorsum. So you'll notice the back surface of the hand uses the same term as the top surface of the foot. Dorsal or dorsum. And the buttocks, one of our favorite places, is gluteal. And in fact, the prominent muscle of the buttocks is the gluteus maximus. Gluteal means buttocks. Uh, the back of the knee is popliteal, or popliteal. Popliteal. Okay? Not to be confused with anticubital, which is in front of the elbow. The sole of the foot is plantar. If somebody had plantar warts, they would have warts on the sole of their foot. The heel is calcaneal. C-A-L-C-A-N-E-A-L. But it's all in your lab manual in a beautiful color picture. All right. Oh, we skipped a couple here. Uh, on, right here, uh, groin is inguinal. That's an important area. Later, we'll learn about an inguinal hernia. Inguinal hernias. We'll learn about that. And the belly button is umbilical. All right. Now, all these terms you need to know, and this is not as many as what's in your lab manual on page three. <clears throat>